And now, please welcome to the stage the Minister of Finance from Tuvalu, the Honorable Seve Ponyu, and the President of Open Society Foundations, Mark Malik Brown, for a conversation on building a sustainable future. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy days. This conversation will be incredibly useful to help frame the dialogue and conversations for the rest of the evening and to really give us a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about a just transition. I think it's often used and referred to with many definitions and understanding of what that exactly means and how we can then orient investments toward collective ends and collective objectives. So I'd like to start with you, Minister. It's such an hon honor to have you with us today. Could you set the stage for us and provide some perspective from Tuvalu, where you live and where you are experiencing climate change and the urgency of climate change on the front lines? When you think about a just transition, what does that mean to you? Someone. Yes, please. Yeah, let me uh, begin by explaining why I am up here and uh, talking uh, to you, Alison, on this uh, uh, important uh, uh, topic. Uh, Tuvalu is uh, located uh, in the Central Pacific Ocean, uh, halfway across from uh, Hawaii in the north and uh, Australia uh, in the south. It is a, a small, low-lying atoll, uh, island nation. Uh, it is barely two meters above sea level. Uh, it is low-lying, so flat, no mountains. Um, and therefore, Tuvalu is uh, one of the few countries that is really at the forefront uh, of the impact of uh, particularly sea level rise and storm surge. Um, so we are actually living and experiencing the impacts of climate change. Uh, we, uh, the science and evidence tells us that uh, uh, in this decade, by the end of this decade, by the year 2030, uh, and 2050 rather, um, over 60% of our land would be inundated uh, because of sea level just coming through. And by the year 2100, um, our country would be deemed uninhabitable. So you just think about that scenario. Um, this is based on uh, current uh, emissions um, and in the impact that might have. So even with uh, the international uh, discussion now underway in terms of um, reducing emissions and you know the 2050 net zero target uh, and, and trying to contain uh, increases in global average temperature uh, by 1.5 degree, uh, Tuvalu would still be uh, inundated uh, by those timelines uh, given the volume uh, already uh, emitted and the resulting impact uh, on sea level rise. Um, so that's the scenario and the predicament that my country isn't, and that's why uh, be, uh, I have accepted uh, to be part of this panel, and Tuvalu has been very vocal uh, in the international arena. Um, first and foremost, uh, for us, uh, it is, our priority is to, is on adaptation. Uh, to protect and save Tuvalu is to build up, build more land and build upwards. That's the only means of saving uh, our country. Uh, and that is basically the true cost of adaptation. However, um, we really, uh, with you and the international community, to try and address the root cause of climate change, which we all know, uh, the greenhouse gas, gases emissions. 
um, and trying to uh, live up to the expectations and the uh, aspirations of the Paris Accords and the 1.5 degree and the, the net zero by 2050 uh, targets. Uh, and that's why Tuvalu is very vocal uh, about um, a just transition away from fossil fuel. We all know that fossil fuel uh, is the culprit uh, contributing to uh, over 86% of the greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, and therefore, we needed to address fossil fuels. Um, so it is Tuvalu's uh, call to the international community uh, and leading up to COP28 uh, in Dubai later this year uh, that there needed to be urgent action taken uh, and delivered uh, by the parties to the UNFCCC to really address these emissions uh, and achieve those targets. Um, our uh, call is to um, get a, a solid outcome out of uh, uh, the COP28 on fossil fuel phase out and a just transition uh, to a low carbon uh, future, economy future, and, and decarbonization. Uh, is particularly for Tuvalu in the Pacific is uh, land transport. Um, so I can talk more about uh, the details uh, uh, through this program, but those are the, our objectives, uh, driven by the impacts that uh, my country now uh, is experiencing, and, and therefore the need for the international community to address the root causes of climate change. Thank you for that and for underscoring the urgency with which we all need to act. And Mark, I'd like to turn to you and reflecting on the minister's comments and also the moment that we're in, both certainly at the IMF World Bank meetings, but also in the global context we find ourselves in, where we are facing fragmentation, high interest rates, high debt. And I know you've spent so much time focused in the last several years on how can the international financial architecture be refined and reformed to more efficiently allocate capital toward these urgent needs. And so reflecting on the comments and, and your experience this week, what is at the front of your mind of what needs to happen next to build on the advancements that have been made thus far? Look, I think it's a very good question and to be honest, for me, this has been an enterprise of more than several years, of long enough to know that funding small island states is an art form of its own, that they have always tended to fall through the cracks of different financial arrangements, having a higher per capita income than poor countries and therefore not qualifying for certain categories of monies. Uh, and secondly, um, you know, being small in population size, which also too often uh, when calculations about allocations are around per capita times income, uh, small islands have traditionally come out short. And, you know, what I think has changed is this dramatic story of potential climate impact, current climate impact, to, to actually eliminate countries, push them underwater. In fact, I can't help, Minister, forgive a slightly macabre joke, but the one thing about this stage is it is well above water level. Um, we're right up, suspended over you all. Um, but the, 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 I think the, the, the sort of bigger point, really, is that precisely because uh, countries like this are at risk, there's a big challenge as to what is the right mixture of grant and investment money for them. You know, it's kind of quite hard to make the investment case for a country which you uh, acknowledge minus that investment might disappear. Um, and so, you know, there is a real requirement, and which is why an issue like this needs to come to meetings like this, for a generous sort of grant-based component to funding the adaptation for communities such as Tuvalu, because you know, it, it's never going to get done through private sector instruments alone, investment instruments alone. And, you know, that is where, 
you know, I, I, I think we still got a donor community who, you know, hide behind clever financial engineering and the sort of prospect, which is always just around the corner, of private sector funds coming in on a financial return basis. There will be a key part of that. We can't hit any of our climate targets without a huge private sector component. But we just have to be realistic about what is investable and what requires grants. And, you know, we need to get meetings like this to recognize the unique case uh, that the island communities have and be smart and forthcoming and forward-leaning about finding solutions for it while there's still time. Thank you for that. And I'd like to ask, ask you both, in your conversations and the meetings this week, is it being recognized? Do you feel like there are being in there are substantive conversations that are being had about the financial architecture and the instruments that are needed from both the public and private sectors? What are you hearing? Yes, so um, I think the international community uh, um, has heard us. Uh, the challenge uh, I see is um, actual uh, changes being done to the international financial architecture. I think the bank, uh, the World Bank, that is, um, are talking about an evolution roadmap, uh, a process of reviewing the uh, general policy and funding arrangements and modality uh, to align with the 2050 net zero target and the 1.5. Um, so I'll be eager and interested to see uh, how does that translate to uh, their investment access uh, uh, procedures uh, and the priorities that they then, uh, uh, you know, allocate their resources. I might say that uh, for Tuvalu's experience, as far as the World Bank and the IMF is concerned, um, uh, as an IDA, so this is a, a grant-based um, funding arrangement uh, for um, high debt distressed countries and, and low-income uh, countries like uh, Tuvalu, um, which then uh, is eligible for grant-based financing from the World Bank, which is called IDA, the International Development Association, uh, resourcing. Um, we have been um, quite fortunate in the f in in, um, in terms of uh, actually Tuvalu driving the prioritization of those uh, funding resources uh, and and prioritizing uh, climate resilient infrastructure investments um, and working with the bank uh, to realize those um, investment uh, projects. Um, there is also a facility that um, is known as a CAT TTO, so a catastrophe drawdown, uh, deferred drawdown operation, um, which is also a grant-based uh, financing um, and is responding to um, a natural disaster. So in, in an event of a natural disaster or climate-related event, um, uh, Tuvalu is able to benefit from that facility under the World Bank. Uh, within 24 hours uh, of making a request uh, to the bank uh, that we are able to immediately uh, get the money uh, through uh, to support us address uh, the natural disaster impacts. Um, so those are the sort of um, funding modalities and arrangements that are uh, very responsive uh, to our circumstances. But generally, um, my uh, view and Tuvalu's call to the international financial institutions and MDBs uh, is to ensure that uh, the funding arrangements are uh, very much streamlined and just echoing uh, uh, the gentleman's uh, comments. Uh, uh, they are provided at scale, at speed, uh, and at the very very concessional terms, uh, given the high debt distress situation that uh, many of our island countries are facing. Um, and then finally, my point is that uh, there needed to be uh, 
additionality. Uh, so it cannot be a reallocation of funding resources from existing pot or pool of money. It needed to be new and additional financing. Um, and then finally, uh, we have been calling for uh, recognizing the unique vulnerabilities of the small island states. Uh, there needed to be a special uh, funding window, uh, a consideration of a special funding window for small states. Um, when you design a, um, a, a, an international uh, financial mechanism, and now the UNFCCC is going through that, uh, following uh, the launching of the Green Climate Fund, which again, uh, a number of countries, including my country, uh, have been facing challenges in accessing that facility. But now we are talking about uh, setting up uh, another fund, uh, loss and damage fund. But I think, um, however the access procedures and uh, requirements that are being developed for any international funding mechanism, the, the small, unique uh, vulnerability of our countries wouldn't be able to access those readily. And therefore, uh, it is our view that uh, there needed to be a special funding window consideration within those broad funding mechanisms uh, that are uh, very responsive and uh, um, geared towards uh, the special needs of the small states. Thank you for that and, and being specific in the examples regarding the financial mechanisms and approaches that are having impact and have the potential to have impact. And so Mark, I think turning to you and from your perspective, what are some of the reforms that you're seeing having impact around the world in the different countries that you're operating in and the projects that you've been working on very closely, you know, what are you seeing that's working and what else needs to be done to really drive and accelerate the impact? Look, I think the first thing to say is that um, the small island states have done an extremely good job of securing their share of the existing cake in a way that did not happen in the past. Uh, through the case that the Minister has made and others have made too, and you'll hear more of during this discussion. Um, I think the problem is the cake isn't growing. Uh, and, you know, that, that's the challenge. And so, you know, I, for example, Minister mentioned Ida, you know, uh, the Gates Foundation and ourselves at OSF or, or did, organized a meeting with the World Bank and different government donors and others on Ida. And, you know, we've had three or four IDAs now where donor contributions have stayed flat and the only reason the resources have grown is you know, the bank reflows and leveraging of the resources through bond, uh, you ex access to the bond market. But this time, it's got to grow. There's got to be fresh uh, government resource in IDA to grow it. And, you know, there's not yet evidence that that's coming into place. There's 15 months to get it there, but it's going to need a huge, huge push because, again, you know, the donors are much more attracted to, you know, trying to sort of hollow out a bit more leverage from the World Bank and, and IMF and others of existing resources and much more reluctant to reach into their pocket for fresh resources. And, you know, you began by mentioning the geopolitical situation, which just complicates that. Um, you know, the world's becoming very unstable. There are security demands on budgets. There is high inflation levels of, un well, not of unemployment, which is pretty full most places in the, in the donor world, but nevertheless, high inflation, high social costs, etc. So, you know, the, you're, you're just not seeing the political will to come through on the scale that, that, that's needed. I would, though, just as a point of optimism, say something about the private sector. The World Bank 
uh, new president, Ajay Banger, you know, has formed a private sector group. He's been explicit that, you know, mobilizing new kinds of private sector finance, not just the sort of project finance of old, but securitizing, for example, part of the bank's loan book and selling it on uh, to the private market, insurance products, which are critical uh, for small island states, which are at risk from hurricanes and other natural disasters. There is innovation in that space, and there's you know, innovation by some of the MDBs as well, I, African Development Bank, for example, and, and others are doing interesting uh, new uh, approaches. But, you know, we're not yet at a point of critical mass where we're anywhere near the famous slogan of billions into trillions. Um, and so, you know, we've got to keep at it. The incrementalism at the moment, which is sort of cash light incrementalism because it's sweating existing resources rather than mobilizing new ones, has got to give way to a sense of global crisis and urgency, which means a lot more resource gets put on the table. Absolutely, and you're teeing up our other panelists very well in terms of African Development Bank and the projects and investments that are being made across the continent, as well as the private sector. Um, we're running short on time for our session, but I'd like to ask very quickly to each one of you then, in light of there being innovation in you know, bonds and work with the Nature Conservancy and others, are there some innovative projects with the IFC to that end, you know, parametric insurance, which we'll talk about later, and other instruments that are innovative. What do you want to see coming out of this week that can mobilize the capital on the scales that are needed, and as you very rightly point out, Mark, that need to be transformational? What would be a win this week for you? For us in Tuvalu, I think <coughs> we would uh, support um, any types of innovative financing instruments that uh, would uh, necessitate uh, additionality, uh, additional uh, resources coming uh, online. The challenge for us is, and I think uh, Mark alluded to right in his uh, opening remarks, that um, when allocating those uh, uh, resources, whether by the bank or IMF and other IFIs, um, they uh, require uh, investable projects. And for a country like uh, my country, uh, which, uh, you know, the conventional investment uh, economic return on investment ratios won't apply, uh, you won't make that a cut, uh, we then uh, fall out of that consideration. Um, so that's why I keep on saying that uh, there needed to be a special funding window uh, dedicated for small states, uh, because we just don't have the scale economy uh, to justify an investment uh, by a, an M MDB or an FI, IFI, uh, which, you know, they have certain uh, return on investment ratio before then they are able to allocate those resources. So that's a challenge for us. Um, and, and I'm all for, uh, uh, you know, mobilization uh, and, and innovative financing instruments and getting the private sector to be involved uh, that would generate additional financing. Uh, that's all good and well. Uh, however, the challenge is how much of that then triggers down to the ground uh, in, in the case of Tuval, for instance. Very important point. And Mark, over to you. Well, look, I, I mean, I think debt for nature swaps and other issues of that kind, that cluster of, 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 of conversation, you know, is really important. But I think there's also, like in so much of this, a conceptual ceiling which holds us back. You know, we still think of debt for nature swaps in a kind of project-like form, um, you know, and we don't yet think of it as a systemic way to deal with how we put a value on nature and its preservation as a central economic concept, as important as any other input, 
into how we measure value. And you know, you listen to someone like Kristalina Georgieva at the IMF, who is by training an environmental economist, and she l allowed to talks in those terms, but she has an institution which keeps on pulling her back towards a much more conventional definition of, of economic value and return. So I think you know one of the key things as we talk about the specific case of a very small but important island whose future is at rest, and then come to some thousands of people gathered in Marrakesh to think about how to change the world, one of the linking things is to move our conceptual framework in ways which put value on preservation of, of, of nature, the planet, et cetera, uh, and work out what is a return on that and then use public subsidy where necessary to reboot our private investment system to reflect that. You know, we just simply, it's not just that we don't have the political courage or will to do it. We've failed so far in the sort of economic and social science imagination to conceptualize this problem in a way which would make it sort of, in a sense, easier to use market mechanisms uh, to support. Thank you both for setting the stage for us and being very clear about the realities that are being faced and the opportunity before us and really what needs to be done. Thank you both for being here with us today and for the work that you're doing. Thank you.